In this video, we're going to learn about how the neuron works and how it generates both its resting potential and its action potential. So let's talk a bit about how neurons work. A resting neuron, meaning a neuron that's not currently receiving a signal or sending a signal, well, it contains potential energy that resides in an electrical charge difference across its plasma membrane. What that means is in its resting state, there's a negative electrical charge directly inside the plasma membrane and a positive electrical charge directly outside of the plasma membrane. This charge difference, this voltage, is called a resting potential. So what is a resting potential and why is it there? Well, it's that charge difference and the reason for the charge difference. So let's learn a bit more about this resting potential. A neuron in its resting state is negatively charged internally due to large negatively charged molecules being sequestered or contained within the cell while positively charged potassium ions are allowed to diffuse out of the cell. Recall these neurons have active sodium potassium pumps. These are molecular pumps that pump sodium outside of the cell while pumping potassium into the cell. Now the potassium that's pumped into the cell is allowed to diffuse out through diffusion, and this is what leads to that negative resting potential. Now a stimulus, is any factor that causes a nerve signal to be generated. And an action potential is the name of that electrical impulse. It's the name of that nerve signal. Now, action potentials are changes in the electrical polarity in a neuron due to an influx of positively charged sodium ions. Now, if you recall, with that sodium potassium pump, sodium ions are constantly being pumped out of the cell against their concentration gradient. So there's a large concentration of sodium ions directly outside of the nerve cells. So here we see in its normal resting state, a negatively charged interior and a positively charged exterior for these neurons. Well, a stimulus will open sodium ion channels along that plasma membrane. If threshold is reached, action potential is triggered. What that means is if there's enough of a stimulus that opens enough of the ion channels, those positively charged sodium ions will rush into the neuron. This rapid movement of positively charged sodium ions into the neuron will then actually cause neighboring sodium ion channels to also open. These sodium ion channels are only open for a brief period of time, soon after which they are closed. Then those sodium potassium pumps start actively moving the sodium ions out of the neuron again. This quickly returns us then to the resting state or the resting potential. So an action potential, this sudden positive internal charge, it's actually a localized electrical event. Meaning it's only happening at one part of the plasma membrane of that neuron. Now, for this to function as a nerve signal, this local event, this short term positive charge, actually needs to be passed along the neuron. This is done in a process known as action potential propagation. And what causes action potential propagation is that the sodium ion channels are open for a brief period of time, after which they're closed and become unresponsive. And the sodium ion channels will open if neighboring areas of the plasma membrane become depolarized. So in essence, this is a domino effect in that if you have some sodium ion channels open, the sodium ions will rush in, changing the electrical polarity opening the next set of sodium ions, in which more sodium ions rush in, opening the next set of sodium ion channels. 
Now those ion channels are only open for a short period of time, and then they close and become unresponsive, allowing the cell to return back to its resting potential. Now an interesting thing about the action potential strength is that action potentials are all or none events. Either threshold is reached and an action potential is generated, or it's not. But no matter how strong or weak the stimulus that triggers them, the action potential itself is the same strength. Now you might be thinking, well, that's kind of weird. I can feel the difference between a strong pressure and a light pressure. I can feel the difference between a very hot object and a slightly warm object. So what's the deal if the action potentials don't change in strength? Well, a strong stimulus will simply trigger more action potentials at a greater frequency than a weak stimulus. So really, that intensity difference you're feeling is the number of action potentials in a given length of time, not how strong those action potentials are. The last topic to discuss, as far as neurons are concerned, is what happens or how does this impulse move from one neuron to the next neuron? Action potentials will be propagated. down the length of the axon until it reaches the end of the axon, which is known as the synaptic terminal. This synaptic terminal is how one neuron will be connected to its neighboring neuron. The synaptic terminal is responsible for transmitting this signal to the receiving cell. chemical synapses are the relay points between two neurons, or between a neuron and an effector cell or receiving cell. Chemical synapses have a narrow gap called the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft separates a synaptic terminal from the sending neuron from the receiving cell. So there's actually a small space between the sending cell and the receiving cell. These chemical synapses rely on neurotransmitters. To carry information from one nerve cell to another kind of cell that will react. So here we can see what one of these chemical synapses looks like. The action potential arrives at the end of the chemical synapse. That triggers a vesicle with neurotransmitters to fuse with the plasma membrane. Those neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft, and that in turn will open sodium ion channels on the receiving cell. If enough of those sodium ion channels are open, this may trigger an action potential in that receiving cell. These are the events that occur at a chemical synapse. Now the neurotransmitters that are released into that synaptic cleft will be there in open ion channels for a short period of time, but those neurotransmitters are quickly broken down by enzymes in that synaptic cleft as well. Chemical synapses can process extremely complex information. Cell bodies, the main body of the neuron, interpret these signals. Now a single neuron may receive inputs from hundreds of other neurons. via thousands of synaptic terminals. This is back where that concept of threshold really comes into play. Is this neuron receiving enough signals that it should generate its own action potential or not? These are the decisions that occur within the cell body of the neuron. So what is a neurotransmitter? Well, a wide variety of small molecules can act as neurotransmitters. Some may be considered hormones, others not, but the job of a neurotransmitter is to somehow impact the activity or behavior of the receiving cell. Now, many drugs act at synapses by increasing or decreasing the normal effect of the neurotransmitters. 
These drugs include things like caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, various prescription drugs, cocaine, LSD, and marijuana, just to name a few. All of these drugs, they either increase or decrease the normal effect of the neurotransmitters at these synaptic terminals. That takes us to the end of our discussion of a neuron and how that neuron works and sends its message. Next, we're going to look at the organization of the central nervous system of vertebrates. Next, we're going to look at the nervous system of vertebrates and how it's organized. See you in the next video.